In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pilgrims to Jerusalem will describe the effect it has on the soul to tread in those very places where God himself trod when he walked the earth. Each pilgrim will be touched in a special way more directly by one or other of the holy places. For many, one of the most moving sights in the holy city is the chapel bearing the name Dominus Flevit, meaning the Lord wept. This chapel is built on the scene of today's gospel, the outcrop where our Lord stopped on Palm Sunday and wept over the city of Jerusalem, which his divine foreknowledge saw would reject him but a few days later. In this chapel, instead of an altarpiece, there is a window, so that when the priest says Mass facing the altar, he sees the same sight our Lord saw that day, except that now the first thing you see on the horizon is the mosque called the Dome of the Rock, a sign that the holy city has been delivered into the hands of infidels. The tears which our Lord shed for Jerusalem are one of those facts of Scripture which reveal his true humanity. True God and true man, the Lord can weep for Lazarus one minute and then raise him from the dead the next. The Stoic philosophers were wrong to say that emotion is unbecoming of man, only we must always strive to keep our emotions under the control of reason. Even the passion of anger in itself is not always wrong, as we see at the conclusion of today's gospel, when anger takes the form of zeal and leads the gentlest of men to drive thieves from the temple with a whip of cords. Weeping over the city that soon was to become desolate, our Savior was but showing that same sentiment of love for the homeland, which his forebears had felt five centuries earlier during their exile. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. For three years, the Lord had given signs fit for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. The works which the Father hath given me to perfect, the works themselves which I do give testimony of me, that the Father hath sent me. But now it is time for the harvest. God had made a covenant with his people, He sent the prophets, and now he had sent his only son. The pious Jew, as he came up to the holy city on pilgrimage, would sing this psalm. Pray ye for the things that are for the peace of Jerusalem. But now the Savior says to them, If thou also hadst known, and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. The destruction of Jerusalem, which our Lord saw as if before his very eyes, had already been foretold by the prophet Daniel as the consequence of the rejection of the Messiah. We read in chapter 9 of his prophecy, The Christ shall be slain, and the people that shall deny him shall not be his, and a people with their leader that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be waste. And after the end of the war, the appointed desolation. In one of his final parables, uttered just days after he wept over Jerusalem, the Lord made his hearers recognize this truth in the parable of the wicked vine dressers. The husbandmen said one to another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And laying hold on him, they killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What therefore will the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those husbandmen and will give the vineyard to others. And dear friends, this is exactly what happened. Scarcely 40 years after Jerusalem had allowed itself to be stained with the blood of the Savior, the Roman siege of Jerusalem, ending in the death of over a million persons, defies description in its horror. Five hundred people a day were crucified until no trees were left. God's patience had reached its limits. 
the old law had reached its end. The vineyard would be given to others. It is no wonder that in the preaching of our Lord, the impending destruction of Jerusalem becomes a symbol of that final cataclysm which shall precede the last judgment. Just yesterday, the church celebrated the great feast of the transfiguration of the Lord, and it is not a coincidence that the date of this feast, August 6th, is also the date on which, in the year 70 AD, the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Our Lord had promised the Jews this sign, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But, St. John adds, he was speaking of the temple of his body. In the Transfiguration, Christ gave his apostles a foretaste of the glorified body in order to forestall their despair at the impending passion. And in the liturgical calendar, it is also not a coincidence, therefore, that the Feast of the Transfiguration falls exactly 40 days before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross on September 14th. Our Lord told the apostles that they must not tell of this vision to anyone until after the resurrection. But once that great miracle had happened, once the true and eternal temple had been raised in glory, the transfiguration could cast its light even on the cross, which is the reason for this hidden link between these two feasts in the calendar. The first Jewish temple was built by King Solomon, the son of David. After that temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians, the Jews built another temple upon their return from exile in the 5th century BC. On that occasion, the prophet Aegeus consoled them by stating, Great shall be the glory of this last house more than of the first, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. In fact, however, the Ark of the Covenant, which had occupied the Holy of Holies in the first temple, never did enter the second temple, and that temple, as I have been saying, has not existed for 2,000 years. How then could this non-existent temple have more glory than the first temple, when the first temple only, and not the second, contained the sacred ark of God's presence? The answer is that it was this second temple that our Lord himself entered and sanctified. When he was presented there as an infant, when he tarried there as an adolescent, when he preached there as the Messiah, and when he cast out the moneylenders in today's gospel. Incidentally, on those few occasions when I have had the pleasure to meet Jewish converts to Christianity, they have always said that the point that made them question the false religion of Judaism is precisely the fact that this earthly temple no longer exists. The Mosaic priesthood has gone into abeyance, and the Jewish sacrifices can no longer be offered. They ask themselves, where then is the sacrifice that shall make our peace with God? We know that the old temple cult became irrelevant after the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. The sacrifice of the Mass, truly pleasing to God, has replaced forever the temporary sacrifices of goats and lambs. The fact that it is now physically impossible to fulfill the law of Moses is the clearest possible sign that this old law has now been superseded. The promises have been fulfilled. The true temple is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Rabbi Jacob Neusner, an American Jewish scholar who unfortunately never did convert to Christianity, has nonetheless raised this perceptive interpretation of the deeper meaning of the incident with the money changers. He writes, The overturning of the money changers' tables represents an act of the rejection of the most important rite of the Israelite cult, the daily whole offering, and therefore a statement that there is a means of atonement other than the daily whole offering, which is now null, then what was to take the place of the daily whole offering? It was to be the rite of the Eucharist, table for table, whole offering for whole offering. It therefore seems to me, the rabbi continues, that the correct context in which to read the overturning 
of the money changers' tables is not the destruction of the temple in general, but the institution of the sacrifice of the Eucharist in particular. As I have been saying, the destruction of the temple is the proof that this indeed is what has happened. For as our Lord himself has said, I tell you that there is here a greater than the temple. Dear friends, when we ourselves come to Holy Mass so as to worship at the true and indestructible temple, then now is the time of our visitation. Let us know the things that are for our peace and come to this divine sacrifice with a clean heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for listening. Please remember to click subscribe and to hit the bell for notifications. And in this age of censorship, please consider helping support us at sensefidelium.com. Under the Donate and Support tab, there are plenty of ways to help support the work and to help grow and sustain the efforts of Census Fidelium in general. May God reward you, and thank you very much.